I'd like you in a moment to welcome Jim Sutherland, who is this week's speaker. Um, Jim, um, I'm not going to spoil what Jim's going to talk about, but he's not going to give a back catalogue of every project he's ever, got, ever worked on, but he's going to talk about a kind of a strange thing that's happened, which he started to work on projects that are all connected uh, because they, the theme is chess. I'm not going to say any more than that, but I am going to tell you that Jim, uh, 14 years ago, set up a company called Hattrick, and within nine years, by 2010, they were the most awarded uh, design agency um, in the UK or in London? Uh, UK. UK, not the world? Not the world. Just no. UK. Okay, I could tell you that some of uh, Hattrick's clients included the Natural History Museum, the University of Westminster, Wimbledon, the Royal Mail, Scottish Opera, British Heart Foundation, Christian Aid, but I won't bore you with those details. Uh, what I could also tell you is that tomorrow, uh, Jim is presenting to the Royal Mail two sets of um, stamp designs. Uh, yes, yes. And I could also make him sound really rock and roll by telling you that this is actually the second lecture he's given today. He's hot-footed it down from Newcastle, where he spoke to students earlier today. That's pretty impressive, right? OK, so without further ado, I'm going <laughs> to hand over to Jim. Uh, please uh, give him a warm welcome for today's Design Dialogues. <laughs> Thanks, thanks for that. Um, quite difficult to follow. Uh, this is a very quick, I'm just, I mean, because I've got 20 minutes. Uh, I left college, I went to Norwich, I left in 1988, worked at the Partners, uh, then worked for HGV, who are no longer, and then, um, as Lawrence said, co founded Hattrick Design uh, 14 years ago next week. Uh, and then last year, I left my own company uh, to have a bit of time off and, and muck about. Uh, and I've now set up my own studio. Uh, it's semi-officially. Um, and uh, I just thought I'd show very uh, just a couple of little projects uh, that we did at Hattrick. So we did all sorts of things, from uh, kids' books. This was a thing that lit up with a torch. Uh, we used to do a lot of hoarding works. We did a lot of work for Ron Bear, New Identity and Hoardings. Uh, we did the Identity for Horniman Museum. Did a lot of museum work, actually. Um, we designed about 60 stamps, I think, in the last 10 years. This is a set we did for Darwin. Uh, that were jigsaw shaped. Spent a lot of time finding an orangutan that looked as much like Darwin as we could. <laughs> um, we did a big rebrand of uh, Williams uh, Formula One last year. Uh, and as I said, we did the identity for the Natural History Museum and then went on to do this whole series of education guides uh, which involved these masks and things. But uh, I'm not going to talk about any of that um, today. I've not given a talk about this uh, before, so it's probably not going to be very good. And, uh, and it's a bit of a sort of trial, but I'll, I'll try and give it a go. Uh, but what I wanted to talk about was my slight obsession with chess. And um, I found this quote, which I thought was really lovely. Um, the fact that I've spent most of my time working in, in an advertising design agency, uh, and I also play chess, so I've obviously completely wasted my intelligence. Um, and I also like to say that I'm completely rubbish at chess, but I just really love playing it, and I partly like the whole thing about the, the visual language and the words to do with it. Uh, and a slight obsession with numbers. So you have 32 pieces, all these different characters. They've all got personalities. Uh, there's the whole notation thing, uh, you, the whole thing about black and white squares uh, and numbers and stuff like this. So when I decided to do this, because I thought it was a short uh, sort of subject to cover, uh, I thought it would be quite interesting just to see what chess projects I'd done. I found out there were slightly more than I'd rea <laughs> realised. Um, but this is uh, something I found in a bookshop last year, uh, which is a book I had when I was little, uh, when my dad taught me to play chess, uh, which I always really loved. And when I found this book, I was really pleased, because it just suddenly brought back, we were just talking earlier about ladybird books, and I saw this, and it suddenly all these memories flooded back. Um, and inside, they used to have these really lovely little drawings uh, of the characters, which really brought them to life. So it's all very dry, sort of graphically, and then suddenly the, these characters for the bishops and kings and queens and things. Um, so, about uh, 1997, it was just when the election was on, um, I uh, started this project in my garden. I decided to build a patio, hate DIY. So, uh, I thought, well, what I could do is build a chessboard, uh, and that will try and get me to do it, um, and then get all my friends to make uh, garden chess pieces. So, uh, this was as it started. So, uh, 
And then I ended up doing a little book of them once they all turned up. We had a couple of games that were completely disastrous because you couldn't tell what any of the pieces were. Um, but a lot of fun. I gave everybody a brief. I bought a really cheap set and sent them all a piece each randomly and then said, we'll all eat in a pub and just bring your piece with you. So this one's made out of Newcastle brown uh, cans because she was from Newcastle, so that's one of the rooks. Uh, Stuart Radford, who's now uh, creative director at Partners, made this one of Roy Castle, which I really liked. Um, this was a garden uh, rake that somebody made into a queen. This was my wife, I met at college, did this um, playing card holding a spade. Um, this guy was a photographer we used to use, and I had to give him a piece because I wanted him to photograph all the pieces. So um, I thought, Jesus, he, he doesn't know how to design anything. Um, and he decided to do a night, so you, you had lights in it. So if you played it at night, it was a night rather than a night. Um, which I actually thought was quite an interesting idea. I thought this is quite impressive that he's thought of this. Uh, and the one on the right is Mark Bonner, who's the current um, DNAD president, made an origami night. But this was about a six feet uh, square piece of paper that was folded up to make this thing. Um, this was the, I did a king, so I went and bought a load of um, Elvis records and uh, with a weight and some screws and just tied the whole thing together. It was just a really lovely sort of thing. It's a really cheesy joke. Obviously. And that was Pierre Vermeer who used to work with um, HGV, was another king. So uh, this project happened and actually the best point of it really was meeting in the pub and all these people bringing these pieces and all the other people in the pub just coming over going, what on earth is going on? There's just all these things sitting around weird objects, stuff like that. And that's when I decided to do a little book, just to send to all the people that had done it. Uh, not for any other reason, really. And, and I think this is where it all started to go a bit wrong, because uh, I suddenly thought when I wrote the intro to it, it needs to be exactly 64 characters. So I sat there rewriting this. It's a really terrible bit of writing, but it obviously fits a perfect 8x8 eight eight square. And when I scanned this in the other day, I suddenly thought this is where it all started to become a bit um, obsessive. And um, so that was the first. <laughs> The first project. The second one um, is called Block. This is a great, um, I think I was talking to my wife about this yesterday. I don't know if you've ever seen an episode of um, The Simpsons where Homer buys Marge a bowling ball for her birthday. And um, this is exactly what happened here. That uh, I came up with an idea for a chessboard and paid one of my friends to make it and then gave it to Becky for her birthday. And she's got absolutely no interest in chess. <laughs> and um, and she reminds, and this board is obviously in my studio now, and she's had absolutely nothing to do with it. But, uh, but she reminded me that I'd given it to her as a present, um, which I thought was very romantic. So, um, so this was Block, and I got a, a fact, the guy I met in Newcastle, I went up yesterday, uh, made it for me, he was, he was a sort of furniture maker. But I had this idea of doing it at different levels. I really liked the idea of doing this big, quite a big board and doing it out of blocks. So basically it steps down in the middle, and this is such a really lovely experience playing chess on this because you feel like you're sort of two armies on each side of a valley and you're fighting down in the middle uh, and again actually it's really difficult to play because your perspective goes and things uh, even though each a gap is only I don't know about five six mil um, so this was the sort of second project I did um, chess related uh, it's really really beautifully made um, he's a really good furniture design actually that led to this project, which uh, I did a couple of years ago th through Hattrick. Um, I had an idea, um, which I'll pass around in a second, actually. I went on holiday. I get bored really easily. And um, I wanted to make a game or something to do uh, with the kids. And uh, so I started to design this typographic um, set of playing cards, which are these, which I'll pass around in a second. And, uh, and I was just looking through this notebook the other day. It's completely obsessive. This notebook's about this big. Um, so the writing in it is really tiny, like some complete lunatic. Uh, and I decided I had to get them all on one page. And like this. But a few pages in, uh, so this is just some examples. And it was just about using the, the typefaces to make, obviously, the suits. Uh, and some rules about not repeating typefaces and um, not uh, altering them at all. So you had to use them as they were found and just move them around to make the, the suits. Uh, and they fit perfectly. Um, I've realised I am going a bit mad, I think. Uh, they fit perfectly on an A2 sheet or SRA2 sheet. Uh, so you can print the whole set up. So I've done these as posters and then they were just cut out to make the playing cards. Um, but a bit further in, the same notebook that's full of little scribblings like this, I had this idea about doing a chess set. Um, 
which this, was, this sketch was probably 2007. So it took me about three years to find somebody who could make it. Uh, it was phenomenally expensive to do because I didn't really want to go and sort of bulk produce it somewhere. So we only did 50 sets. Um, but a very simple idea of using chess notation, but making the pieces from the letters. Um, and uh, so I just redrew some typefaces. There was lots of problems with the P constantly falling over, so I had to move the counter back and things like this. A lot of fun to do. Um, and then this was the set. So this was, uh, say, about two years ago, I suppose, when it was all completely finished. Uh, again, it's completely impractical to play with, um, but that's fine. Um, and, uh, but I was really keen to do them deep enough so they felt like chess pieces, uh, even though you're moving the letters around. Um, uh, this was on a few uh, design blogs and things, and I suddenly started getting abusive notes about why I wasn't using an N for knight instead of a KT, uh, which is, and they use an N now, and they have done since, like, I don't know, 1960-something. But when I was first learning to play chess, that book I had used a KT, so I had to keep saying, well, that's why I've done a KT. And it's much nicer than using an N, I think, you know. But um, some people weren't happy about it, purists of chess people. Um, so this was the whole board. So I designed the board, which I'll come to in a second, uh, and all the packaging and things. Uh, it, was just, it was just a lot of fun to do, good, nice sort of typographic exercise. Uh, and we sold pretty much all of them just to cover the costs, but they were several hundred pounds just to make. Um, so completely insane, really. Um, and then I did a little set of postcards uh, to go with them, which just showed the ways the pieces moved. So it's a bit of information design almost. So, you know, the rooks moving straight lines and the bishops moving diagonally and things. Um, that led on to this uh, pro project, um, which I think is probably the, we the weirdest one I've done that's chess related. Um, this was called 8x8. Eight eight. So when I was designing the, uh, the board for the chess set, um, I was just looking at this thing, just graphically, it's really lovely. It's 32 black, 32 white squares. So I went out and bought a little squared note kid's notebook uh, and, and sat in a pub um, colouring in the squares like some autistic child and um, whilst drinking and smoking and um, uh, drinking Guinness, which I quite like this photograph because it's black and white, you know. Um, and I sat here for quite some time <laughs> filling in this notebook. And then I, um, uh, so, and then I thought I just want to do this, you know, in a way of just colouring in the squares. It's just so much fun to do, you know, and um, for me. Uh, <laughs> and, um, so then I just, then I went back onto the computer and just started drawing some of them up. Uh, so they all follow this rule of 32 black, 32 white squares. They're exactly the same, but they're just reconfigured. Uh, and you just started to get some really lovely uh, patterns and little thoughts about, you know, how things break up into squares. Uh, these sort of tessellating patterns. This one I really like. I like the idea of a chessboard that's just all white and all black, depending on which side you're playing on. Um, then I uh, spoke to, who I'll talk about in a second, uh, a computer programmer guy I know. And I was, as I was colouring in my notebook, I was thinking it would be really lovely to get to 64 uh, different variations. And I thought, I wonder if there are 64. I thought, there must be. But it took me a long time to get to like 30. And so I phoned him up and I just said to him, uh, can you work out how many variations there are of 32 squares that are black and white? And he texted me back, this is when I was in the pub, saying there are approximately 2 million trillion variations. <laughs> I thought, fuck, you know. And then, and then, about a few minutes later, he suddenly sent this. And he said, precisely, there are this number of variations. Um, and I thought, I'm only going to do 64. But uh, <laughs> I just think that, I don't even know how to say that number. I just, I just really love it. So this comes through on your phone, and it's like, you know, about four lines of one number. <laughs> um, so then I, I decided to do these 64 different uh, reconfigured chess boards. I don't really know why, but um, it, was, it was just so much fun to do, you know. Um, some are just sort of patterns, some of little ideas, things like that. Uh, and then I did a little book of them, which I'll pass around in a sec. Um, and and this, we sent this to sort of clients and a few friends and things like that. Uh, but for no other reason, really, than just the, the joy of putting it together. Um, so it was a graphic experiment by me, designer and poor chess player. Um, and it's a 64-page book, you know, obviously. Um, it's just printing black and white. It's, it's obsessive, uh, but they just think I think they're lovely. Every time I look at them, I think they're lovely. 
then I got another friend of mine who's a carpenter uh, to make me some boards. Uh, I didn't give this to my wife because the, the first one hadn't, <laughs> hadn't gone down too well, I felt, as a present. So, um, so he, these, these are made about this sort of size and he made them all as, as blocks uh, and stuck them all together and they all just fell apart straight away. So it, these have all got little tongue groove things between each square, holding them all together. Uh, so it took him a huge amount of time and I paid him very little money. Um, I tried to convince him it was like an artistic thing to be, for him to be doing. Um, I'm not really sure he was sold on that. But, uh, so I've got these at home now. These are also completely impossible to play chess on, uh, but, which is fine. It's particularly the top left one, because you think it's a normal chess ball, then it all goes a bit wrong in the middle. So. Um, but beautifully made, just out of two, uh, two types of wood. Uh, and I'm currently doing some screen prints, because uh, it's something I wanted to do while I was off, uh, of showing all 64, so it's a sort of composite of all of them. Um, and I just think it's something, again, I, I'm not sure what I'm going to do with them once I've done them. It's an addition of 64, obviously. Uh, just printing onto grey board. I think just graphically, I just really like the look of it. Um, the other thing I'm then doing, this is the one I'm doing at the moment, I'm going to stop after this, but uh, is a computer chess thing. And just when I was doing the boards, again, I was talking to the programmer guy, and I said to him, I really like the idea. This is just a mock-up of it, because I've got absolutely no idea how we're going to do it yet. But I really like the idea that as you're playing it, if white starts to win, uh, the board starts to turn white. So, um, and I, this is just a quick sort of mock-up. I haven't worked out how to do this, so it sort of works with the game and what happens if the game ebbs and flows. And, but I just love the idea that as black starts to get completely annihilated, they end up with some little black squares in the corner where their pieces are, uh, and the whole board is going white. And I think it would just be a really nice way to, as you're playing, to realise you're in trouble, uh, because you can see the board is changing colour in front of you. So, um, so I'm trying to convince him to somehow programme this for me. Uh, but I'm not sure if he's going to, but uh, hopefully. Uh, then one of the things I've been doing in the last couple of years is uh, working with a guy called Kelvin Smith, uh, who's a letterpress designer, uh, who I went to college with. He was a few years below me at college, uh, who was Alan Kitchen, worked with Alan Kitchen for a long time uh, and taught here, I think, for some, quite some time. Uh, and so I turned up to do some letterpress things with him, uh, and he'd been doing all this work with... Um, uh, typographic ornaments, these little squares. Uh, and this was in the midst of when I was doing this. So I just thought, oh, this will make a lovely uh, chessboard. So I set a load more of these, um, like this, uh, and then printed this um, white check chessboard as a sort of uh, limited edition print. And it's just really, because the ornaments are so beautiful, uh, it just makes these really lovely squares. They're all uh, 12 pica square. And, um, so that's been a, that was a lot of fun to do. So we finished that quite uh, well about a year ago, I think. Um, and then the other thing I saw that he'd been using was um, things called mount blocks, um, which aren't you know supposed to be printed. But he'd raised some up and he'd done some printing with these, some really nice work using these squares. So I thought, well, I can just sort of appropriate that uh, with him. Uh, and so I printed black check, which is almost the complete opposite of the other one. The other one's all ornamental and beautiful. This is all much more industrial and things. But you can see the metal and the doweling coming through and stuff like that. So I ruled all this up and uh, printed these, which are here. I've not had any of this shot yet, so it's all a bit uh, rubbish photographs. But. Uh, and now what I'm doing, uh, this is the other project I'm doing, though, <laughs> is I'm overprinting this one uh, with uh, chess openings. I know nothing about chess openings. I've bought lots of books, none of which I understood, uh, and just picked them because I like the names. Um, so this is just the initial position, obviously, where the pieces start. Uh, but you get things like Petrov's Defence. And again, it's all this notation stuff. I just think it looks really wonderful. It's like some weird maths sort of language. Um, and so this is overprinted silver onto the, onto the boards. But it also, I think, looks absolutely lovely when we were proofing it when you don't have the board there. So it just shows you these two moves uh, to start Petrov's Defence, um, which I just I thought that was really lovely. I wish I'd kept a few of these, actually, think about it. Um, and that's it for my chess projects thing. And so just at the end, I thought I'd put in... I've done this a bit quicker than I thought, actually. Oh, we have. OK. Uh, part of when I was doing, especially the type chess set, I started to collect uh, images more than... because I couldn't afford to buy them all, of uh, chess sets and chess graphics that have been done. Set up a little Tumblr blog, uh, which I haven't updated for ages. Um, but just started to collect things that I really liked. So this is from... I've just put a few in here. This is from the Lewis chess set, really famous chess set that's at the British Museum and National Museums of Scotland. Uh, and I love this. This is a bishop. 
but it's a berserker. So he's going mad, and that's why he's biting his shield. I think this is absolutely lovely. Um, there's this set, really famous uh, design at the Bauhaus, uh, which graphically I always really thought was beautiful. Uh, and then I realised, because I'm a bit slow with these things, that things like the bishop is the cross because he moves in diagonals. And the knight has got this little bit taken out of him because he moves in a... And I think that's just fucking lovely. Um, <laughs> and it comes in a really nice box. Look. Um, Joseph Hartwig. So this is like 1920-something. I just think that's amazing. And you see a lot of the modern sets, some of which are hideous, you know, this... Uh, well, in fact, there is a Simpsons set, which I haven't got, but... Um, but I think there are some really lovely sort of modernist ones. Another one is this one, uh, which um, the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Uh, I bought a copy of this because it wasn't quite so expensive. And um, this, I think, is lovely, just graphically really lovely. But again, uh, what's really nice about it is it fits in a perfect uh, box. And, um, you know, what a fucker. I mean, that's just... <laughs> And I've got this, and uh, I've never taken it out of the box. Because <laughs> every time I, I, took, I took this photograph the other day, and I just thought, I don't want to split this up, and I won't ever be able to put it back together again, I suspect. Um, <laughs> but it looks lovely anyway, and again, there's an illusion for what some of the pieces are. So the bishop's got this diagonal, the king and the queen. Really beautifully done, really simple, but really beautifully done. Um, and then it does that, I just, you know. And even the little diagram thing is lovely. Um, this is a really famous one. Marshal Duchamp very famously um, played a lot of chess. Uh, and this is one he did as a, a rubber stamp set. So that you could stamp your moves on a little card to play uh, chess by post, which I just thought was really lovely. There's lots of boxes, actually. I this, I think, is really nice. Uh, this is Yoko Ono did this in the 60s or 70s. And um, this was a piece chess set. So uh, there aren't any colours. They're all white. And it's a whiteboard. And um, I've, I'd just love to try and have a game on this, because obviously once you started attacking anybody, no one would know whose pieces were whose. <laughs> so I'm not sure if that would be peaceful or just carnage. But um, I just think it looks, it's a terrible picture, but I think that looks absolutely amazing. Such a nice idea. Uh, impractical chess sets, I'm quite interested in that. Uh, this is last couple, but um, this is something I found, which I think is really beautiful. It's called the Knight's Puzzle. Uh, and it was a, some mathematical problem that somebody came up with. And basically, you start in a certain place and you move the knight, you know, the two squares across and two and one up. Uh, and you have to touch every single piece, uh, every single square on the board, but only once. And it makes this absolutely wonderful pattern. And you start there and finish there. I think that's just beautiful. And there's lots, quite a lot of paintings have been done and stuff like this. Really nice. Uh, Paul Clay, really nice painting. I managed to see this in Zurich when I went last year, uh, which was lovely. It's one of those things now, I think, that you, you find all these references and then you go and find, you go to a gallery and suddenly see another chess piece and then you go and put it on the blog and stuff like this. But I thought this was really beautiful. Um, and no real regard for the numbers of squares or pieces or any of that. It's not, nowhere near as anal as some other things. Uh, this I thought was really lovely. I found that uh, Frith Kerr did a few years ago, which was just a tablecloth with a chess set printed on it. Uh, and I think that's a chess ball printed I think that's really lovely. Um, uh, Noguchi designed this really lovely uh, chess table, which looks like all his other tables, but for some reason it's for chess. So, um, And then the last slide was this. This is uh, from the Seventh Seal, where um, the main character plays uh, chess against the Grim Reaper. Uh, and he has to keep going uh, to keep himself alive. Something like this. But really beautiful, very you know, uh, powerful sort of moment in the film uh, involving chess. And that's it. So I thought I'd just pass this around. Please do. <laughs> I realised that was a bit strange, but. Uh, <laughs> um, so look, um, we speak into the mic because it's recorded, not for any voice projection um, and I'll ask the first question that's the kind of bit that just to ease you into it um, okay wow um, <laughs> you, you described um, your exit from Hattrick as you're going to take 12 months sabbatical yes. before you start getting involved in you know yes. commercial yeah. graphic yeah. design branding again um, could you have found the space and the time if you'd stayed at Hattrick to be 
I don't want to use the word obsessive, but you've had the space to be able to kind of look at this yes. over the last kind of nine, ten yeah. months or so. Um, did you need to leave the company you set up in order to create enough space and time to be able to work on these things that are, yes. are, are extra? Because it sounds like with the, with the chess set that you made, what, 50 copies of while yeah. you were at Hattrick? Yeah. There was a lot of a, a kind of accommodating yes. of this obsession yeah. with yeah. your uh, <laughs> the rest of your team. Um, but now the, the, the freedom's there, right? Yes. You can do yes. whatever you want, whenever you want. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting question. I think it's almost the other way around that most of these things I did when I was still there and I carved out the time right. to do them and because I, I, I wanted to do them and I always felt it was a great thing to send clients and, and it sort of, for me, fed into other studio work and stuff like that. Uh, and it was just a lovely thing to be doing. And I think in some ways, by carving out that time, I suddenly thought I could just do this all the time. And so it almost became a sort of self-fulfilling thing. That's what I feel. And uh, now I want to spend more time doing things like this, uh, which is what I'm doing, as well as doing work, and have no... There wasn't really a lot of pressure. I mean, Gareth, who's my partner there, uh, didn't do these... You know, he's sane, didn't do these sorts of things. Um, and I did, and I carved out time. I was just doing them at weekends and evenings, and occasionally in the studio if we had a bit of downtime, which we never really did. Um, but I think it was the, the expression of doing those projects that made me think, oh, I could do a bit more of this. Uh, and at one point, the last sort of two years, we took off Friday afternoons to do sort of research projects. Uh, told all the designers we weren't there, even, even though we were, uh, and they weren't allowed to talk to us. Uh, and we just got on, well, I got on with things like this. And Gareth went home, um, <laughs> <laughs> which was fine. And I, did, I didn't mind. I thought, this is what I do in, you know, in my spare time. Uh, and I try and get my kids to do it, if I can, you know, if I can be bothered. And um, so I think it was uh, that Friday afternoon thing became just really lovely. Uh, and work was really, you know, really good. It wasn't like a terrible time or anything. But I just suddenly thought I could spend more time doing this sort of thing. If I have a bit of time off, I can have a bit, of, which is what's happening now, a bit of an explosion of these type of things. They're not all chess, chess related. Uh, and then it'll just be a nice, you know, and then I'll ease myself back into doing proper work. Um, you know. Can I ask one other question before I pass it on? Um, so you, s you mentioned you did 60, sta 60 stamps in 10 years. Yes. A single one of those chess related? No, although I have been collecting chess related stamps. <laughs> <laughs> just not by me. Um, I'm sort of hoping if a chest thing comes up, then they might ask me to do it. Do they know at uh, the Royal Mail about your I think chest I thing? think quite a few people know about okay. my chest. Yeah. Yeah. But funnily enough, the, I met uh, John Rushworth from Pentagram a couple of years ago. In fact, when I was doing some judging, when I was doing those coloured squares, and I was just talking to him, not about chess, because I didn't know him. You know, he's like a grown-up. And, um, and he said, oh, and I said, what are you doing at the moment? He goes, oh, I'm doing this thing for the World Chess Organisation. And I just, I, I, you know... I wanted just to punch him. <laughs> and, um, and I'd read an article a few months before about the guy who'd bought, I don't know anything about any of this stuff, but the politics of some governing body got bought by some businessman who wanted to you know, brand it and all this sort of stuff. I remember thinking, God, oh, that'd be an amazing job. Did nothing about it. I mean, obviously, and we would have been too late by then. And this guy knew somebody at Pentagram and so, and they did, which is on the blog, but not on here. So I thought better shouldn't show anybody else's work. Uh, and it's really lovely. They've done a really nice mark and they did some really lovely graphics around it. And, um, but I just thought that's not going to come up again now, so I need to get obsessed about something else. Uh, playing cards, that'll be the next <laughs> thing. So. Right, I'm going to pass the mic over. Whose hand's going to shoot up first? <laughs> Very well done. <laughs> Hello. Um, you, you said you're really obsessed with um, the precision, like with yes. all the numbers, it always comes back. Yep. And do you think? This um, precision and um, it, it makes the difference in in graphic design works compared to I don't I don't want to say bad graphic design yep. work, but you know what I mean like yep. um, the intention and precision in the work. Yes. Do you think it's that's a key point for branding or even yep. graphic design? I think in that's a really good observation. Actually, uh, I think it uh, I think it is. Yeah, not to say all work needs to be precise. But I think that uh, level of um, th thinking and, uh, what's the word, um, not, just, not just precision, but 
exploring uh, everything. Yeah, and exactly. And but having fun, but within rules. Mm. I think there's something about rules which are obviously, you know, they're to be broken, all that nonsense. But um, uh, there's something about those rules. It just, it's like doing that, you know, it's got to be, and I think it does apply to lots of work. As soon as you make that chess book 64 pages, mm. it just makes me smile. And books are done in sections that are 64 pages. Yeah. No one knows that, really, apart from other designers and when I tell people. That's and a kind of private story. Yes, Once it is. Once you know it, yeah. you Yeah, that's you right. And I personally and apply that type of thinking to all the projects I do. Yeah. And I, th I think it's a really good, you know, it is that site sort of precision and what makes this, what just gives it a little bit more of a story or an interest. Um, a point of difference. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and then it's something you can tell people and then it has a bit of a story and, you know. Uh, I think it's always nice to do that. Uh, and it doesn't have to be obvious things, it can be quite... You know, yeah. Um, okay. but, um, cool. Thank your partner, Gareth, is it? Yes. Um, but I wondered if you could say something about working in partnership, how you came to work with a particular person, yeah. why you work together, yeah. are you opposites? Or yeah, do you okay. Well, uh, I set up with two partners, uh, fro uh, from the partners, uh, from years ago, and then we've all worked at different places, then got back together and really just knew each other as friends, sort of socially. Uh, all had similar design sensibilities. Uh, and actually when we set up, I think all had slightly different skill sets and things like that, uh, if, 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 if we had any. <laughs> but, um, and then gradually over, over time, and then we started to get a lot more work in and, and it, the sort of company grew. Uh, one of the partners left, Dave, uh, to set up his own thing. And then Gareth and I ran it ourselves. And I, I think it's wrong for me to say Gareth's not obsessive. He is about design but I don't think he allows himself the space to go and, and muck about as much as I want to. And, uh, but which was fine, and the balance between us was, was good. You know, he could see the benefit of us, you know, some, a lot of these projects we used to send to our clients, they liked being sent something that wasn't some sales brochure, but was just something you had an interest in. Um, but I do think perhaps towards the end, as I started to speed up doing this stuff, we were still really busy uh, I think part of him was starting to think, well, he could be channeling that energy into, you know, proper, proper work. <laughs> uh, and I, I think, it's, you know, I think he was probably right, you know. Uh, but I thought that's just not where perhaps I want to go at the moment, uh, which is... So, I, and I think also I just wanted a change, so that's why I left. So it's all been very amicable. I spoke to him um, this morning, actually. But um, it was just somewhere I wanted to sort of go. Um, and, but I think, you know, both of us were... You know, to be fair, Dave perhaps less less so. Dave's like a sane person. Gareth and I were completely mental about the amount of work we did and the level of work we wanted to do it to, and uh, you know the standards and just just the quantity of work and and the amount of effort you put into every single thing. Um, so we were both mad. I think that's perhaps why Dave left. Um, but I, th I feel I've got slightly more mad than Gareth now. So it's a sort of slippery pole type thing, you know. But. Uh,